How many of you know that if we don't learn what we would consider some of the hard stuff, that we really won't ever be what God wants us to be? I think you all know if you watch my program that although I believe I'm very encouraging and I spend a lot of time teaching you how much God loves you and the good plan He has for your life and who you are in Christ, we don't serve up dessert all the time at Joyce Meyer Ministries. We have a lot of meat and nasty tasting vegetables that will help you grow and be strong in the Lord. We want you to be like Popeye so tonight you're going to eat your spinach. Amen? <laughs> Hebrews 12, 11, for the time being, no discipline brings joy, but seems grievous and painful. But afterwards, everybody say afterwards. Say later on. later on. It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. A harvest of fruit which consists in righteousness, in conforming to God's will and purpose, thought, and action, resulting in right living and right standing with God. And then he actually goes on to say, so then brace up and reinvigorate and set right your slackened and weakened and drooping hands. Strengthen your feeble and palsied, tottering knees. So he's kind of saying, okay, if God's dealing with you about something, if he's taking away some of your toys, if he's pushing you out of your comfortable little padded nest and you're finding a few thorns in your life, you can tell that God is dealing with you about something that there's some things that maybe you've gotten by with for a long period of time that you're kind of beginning to get the message that God's really not going to put up with me behaving that way anymore. That instead of going around with your head hanging down, your shoulders drooping and feeling all bad, you need to just shake all that off and you need to rejoice simply because even though discipline doesn't feel good while it's going on, it is the only thing that is going to ever produce in our life what we say we want but will never have without discipline. <laughs> That's okay if you're a little slow, I get it. How many of you would say that God is definitely dealing with you in some areas of your life right now about some behaviors or, you know, just some... It, it's it's kind of hard, isn't it, when you've gotten by with something for a long, long time and God wasn't really touching on that area. And now, now all of a sudden, man, He is in the middle of us every time we do that thing. How many of you are glad that God doesn't deal with you about everything all at once? That would really be hard, wouldn't it? Well, how valuable is the peaceable fruit of righteousness? He says that if we will go through the discipline, that it will bring a harvest of the peaceable fruit of righteousness in our life. You know, I don't think there's anything worse than laying down at night with a guilty conscience. There's nothing worse than waking up in the morning with a guilty conscience. Nothing worse than trying to pray and yet you know there's something between you and God that's not settled. And there's nothing better, there's nothing more wonderful, nothing more comfortable than having grown in God to the place where you can say, I don't know of anything in my life that is wrong between me and God. That doesn't mean there isn't, but you don't know of anything. There's nothing that God is dealing with you about that you're purposely ignoring or being disobedient about. Then you have that peace, and peace always brings joy, and it brings that sensing of righteousness there's nothing worse than guilt and condemnation and feeling all wrong about everything in your life, including yourself. Can anybody say a big amen to that? Amen. That's a terrible feeling. So it really is worth it to discipline yourself. It's worth it to learn everything you can about discipline and self-control because it's the only thing that's going to bring you into that peaceable fruit of righteousness that we all really desire. A football coach, I think his name was Vince Lombardi, he said that he was going to teach the young men how to discipline themselves so they could have what they said they wanted but never would have without it. I'm sure that you have dreams and visions for your life. You have goals. There's areas in your life where you want to better yourself, whether it's financially or physically or in business or in ministry, whatever it might be. 
And it's impossible to get there without higher and higher levels of discipline. You see, I believe what a lot of people want today is they want what I call the perks without the works. <laughs> the perks without the works. Except it just doesn't work that way. There's a lot of people today, a whole generation of people who didn't grow up in the era when we did, when people expected to work really hard for a long time before they got raises or they got a lot of vacation or they got a lot of fringe benefits. And now people always will ask you, not all people, but a lot of people will ask you, they want to know all about their benefits. Before they know anything else, they want to know all about their benefits. And sadly, they're not all that interested in the work, but they sure want the benefits. There's a real sense of entitlement in our world today, and it's a very, very dangerous thing. We're all created equal by God, but honestly and truly, we're not automatically entitled to anything. We all do have equal opportunity, but if we're not responsible human beings, then we cannot expect to have what the people have who are being responsible. And one of the most ridiculous things that I think that is happening today is people who don't want to work and don't want to do anything. I didn't say couldn't work. There are people who need help and we need to help them. But people who don't want to work and they don't want to be responsible and they don't want to do their part, wanting to live off of all the people who do work hard and do their part. And that's actually going a long way toward ruining a lot of things in our society, including the people who do work hard, it can kill their motivation to want to keep working. We should have reward for hard work. Now, let me clarify a couple things before we go any further. When I talk about working hard, I'm not talking about works of the flesh. Works of the flesh is us coming up with a plan of how we're going to make something happen and us running off in our own energy, leaving God out of it, trying to make something happen that really only God can happen, only God can make happen. I'll give you a couple of examples. I spent a lot of years spinning my wheels trying to change my husband. It didn't work. I spent a lot of time trying to change my kids, two of them in particular. One of them was my older son, and he and I just did not get along. I always say I loved him because he was my son, but I didn't like him. And he works for me now, and you can laugh at me if you want to, but some of you have kids that you don't like. You just wouldn't be bold enough to stand up and say so. Come on now, let's just get honest. Well, the interesting thing that I discovered as he got older and I got older in the Lord was that the reason why I didn't like him was because he was just like me. And you see, the truth was, was he was a type A choleric, I was a type A choleric, and so we were both just fighting for control all the time. And I just did not understand what was wrong with him. But the same thing that I thought was wrong with him was wrong with me. And instead of trying to change him or my husband or my daughter who wasn't as tidy as I wanted her to be, I should have been letting God deal with me and work on me. Well, it took me a lot of years of frustration and wasted effort to discover that that was not a work that God had assigned to me, but it was my work. It was a work of my flesh. And any time that we are in works of the flesh, trying to make something happen that only God can make happen, there's only one thing that we can end up being, and that is frustrated. Miserably frustrated, because we always get frustrated when we're trying to make something happen that no matter what we do, it's just not working. Can anybody say? Amen. Amen. At the same time, I had a couple of neighbors I was working on. So I was a busy lady. I was working on Dave, two of my kids, my neighbors. I was also trying to change myself, which that doesn't work either, because only God can change us. We can do our part. Our part is to study, to know the scripture, to pray, and to wait on God to do in us what only he can do. My part was to pray for the people that 
I saw issues in their life and to be very careful in how I prayed, not, oh God, you need to change Dave and you need to change this and you need to change that, but God, change me first and foremost before you change anybody because I've got more problems than anybody else and do the work in all of us that you believe needs to be done. I was also trying to make my ministry grow. Well, you see, I wanted the fruit of a large ministry, but I had all these other issues in my life, even though I was called to do what I'm doing. And I was doing a little of it. I was teaching some home Bible studies, and I did that for five years, and then I went to work at a church, and so I was teaching a few hundred people, and, and I ministered there and taught in Bible college. But I had a goal to do what I'm doing now. That was the thing that God had put in my heart, to literally teach people the Word all over the world because I love the Word and, and I wanted to see people have what God wanted them to have. But I had character issues. A lot of people have a gift that will take them somewhere, but they don't have enough character to keep them there once they get there. So we need to not be in such a hurry and let God do in our lives what He wants to do Forget about what he needs to do and everybody else that you know. Come on now, I'm preaching better than you're acting. Forget what God needs to do in the lives of everybody else that you know and say, God, do a work in me. Well, the only way that our character is ever going to be developed is through discipline and self-control. And that means that we need to through the grace and the mercy of God, line our lives up and line our behavior up with the Word of God. It's going to hurt. It's going to be hard. You're going to have to die to self. There's going to be a lot of flesh that's going to have to go to the cross. But God has given each one of us a spirit of discipline and self-control. There's no point in saying, I don't have any self-control, because that is not biblically true. 2 Timothy 1.7 God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And the Amplified Bible says that a sound mind is a spirit of balance and discipline and self-control. It means we can think right, and if we can think right, then we can behave right, because our behavior comes from our thinking. Now, God has given us that, but it comes to us in seed form, he puts it in us spiritually at the new birth. Every one of you tonight that received Christ as your Savior, do you know that you got a brand new nature? Now, you're going to look at yourself in the mirror. You're not going to look any different. For a long time, you may not act any different. But I'll tell you what is going to happen. Now, a lot of the things that you used to do that didn't bother you at all, now you're going to try to do them, and they're going to bug you. And you're going to have this little sicky, funny, yicky, yucky. Just not going to set well with you like it used to. Well, if you'll listen to me, you know what your mother used to say, if you listen to mama. So I'm taking a little spiritual liberty here and say, now, if you'll listen to mama, I've lived long enough and been through enough of this stuff that I can tell you that it's either going to be God's way or you're not going to be happy. So you can settle that for yourself tonight. However many times you want to go around the mountain is up to you. But it will either be God's way or it'll be no way. If you want to have peace and joy, then you got to learn how to live out of your spirit, not out of your head. The moment that you receive Christ tonight, those of you who watch by TV, if you were to ask Christ into your heart tonight, if you would repent of your sins and say, God, I love you, I believe in you, Jesus, I believe you died for me, and I want you as my Savior, if you would receive Christ tonight and turn away from sin, you would get a brand new nature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things pass away, and all things become brand new. But where does that happen? It happens in your spirit. It doesn't happen... You, you don't get a renewed mind all of a sudden. Your emotions may not feel any different. Your will may be still very stubborn. But you also get the fruit of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, which happens at the new birth, you get all the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, meekness, 
humility, self-control, self-control. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. And if you're a believer, it's in you. So don't ever say again, I just don't have any self-control. I'm just not a disciplined person. It's in you in a seed farm, and the way you water that seed is through the Word of God. The Word is called the water of the Word. And it's called the water of the Word because hearing the Word of God tonight, just sitting there and receiving this by faith, mix your faith with my faith tonight, and as the preaching comes forth, believe that the Word is working in you, mightily working in you, and that something is happening on the inside of you. And it's going to make you want more of what God has for your life than you want your own way. So the more you spend time with God, the more you pray and study, the more you read the Word, the more you read good books, the more you let the Holy Spirit confront your behavior, the more you see the good fruit that comes from doing the right thing, the more you're going to want to do the right thing. And so eventually the Bible says that we grow into trees, not just little seeds, but trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord, why? That He might be glorified. I don't want to be nasty, but many of us in our past lives before Christ spent a lot of time glorifying the devil. We let him use our mind, we let him use our mouth, we let him use our attitude, we mistreated people, we were selfish and self-centered, and God was not getting any glory out of that. We were living for ourselves. But now we can turn all that around by letting God do what He wants to do in our lives. It's not all going to be easy. It's not all going to be fun. But in the end, it's all going to be worth it. God didn't save us just so we could get everything we wanted. I said, God didn't save us just so we could get everything we wanted. He wants us to have nice things. He wants us to be blessed. But we are destined to be molded into the image of Jesus Christ. That's our destiny. Our destiny is not just to be the richest person on the planet, or to have the biggest ministry on the planet, or to have everything we want, or to be the president of the company. Our destiny, our true God-given destiny, is to be molded into the very image of Jesus Christ. So just like Jesus come to show us what the Father was like, and he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I've come to represent the Father. Well, now he's gone to heaven and he's left us to do the job that he was sent to do. Only He can only be one person in one place at one time. He said, if I go away, you will not only do the works that I've done, but greater works than these will you do. Why? Because there's a whole lot more of us. And what in the world would be happening today if every person who calls themselves a Christian was actually representing Jesus Christ out in the world today? What do we think would be happening in this world? I can tell you one thing, if we would have been standing up and being who we needed to be all this time, we would not have the problems in the world that we have today. This is about more than you having a bumper sticker on your car a cross hanging around your, work, your neck and taking a trip to church a couple times a month. This is about getting down to business and saying, okay, God, I'm tired of just playing church. If I'm going to call myself a Christian, then I want to be the real deal. I'm ready to hear about discipline and self-control and everything else I need to hear to be molded into the image of Jesus Christ. That is your destiny, to be Christ-like. And that's my destiny, to be Christ-like. Now, another thing I want to say about discipline, and I intend to say this a few times this weekend. Discipline is a lot more than just willpower. It's not just a matter of you leaving here and saying, that's it, bless God. I'm going to get my life straightened out. I'm going to get out of debt. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get my house cleaned up. I'm going to read three chapters in the Bible every day. I'm going to pray for two hours. Hallelujah. That's it. That woman got me all stirred up. And I'm telling you what, I'm going to be disciplined and self-controlled. 
Now, that's exactly the way I used to respond to messages like this. Because I have a pretty strong willpower. But to be honest, God doesn't, although our will is involved, and he says, I set before you life and death, choose life. There's something that I'm learning more and more and more every day of my life. I've known it for many years, but God just does not let me get away from it. Even something that God commands us to do, we still can't do successfully unless we lean on Him. Now, do you hear me? I have a gift to teach and preach, but I would not dare come out here without having leaned on God and waited on God because I know that if He doesn't speak to you through me, you are going to be bored silly. We have to understand really and truly what the Bible says in John 15, apart from me, ye can do nothing, nothing. We need to learn more about waiting on God. And waiting on God is a little different than reading, studying, or praying. It fits more into the area of fellowship with God, quiet time with God. One definition that I read the other day said that it's lingering in the presence of God, being quiet and just letting Him know that you know that you can't do anything if He doesn't make it happen. So I really want to encourage those of you that are convicted that you need higher levels of discipline and self-control in your life. By the Word of God, I want to get you convinced that you do have that seed of discipline and self-control in you. And it is something that you can work with the Holy Spirit to develop. But I would like to encourage you to spend a little time every morning as part of the rest of your time with God or in the afternoon, in the evening, whenever you spend time with God. And I might as well just stop here and say, if you don't spend time with God, then you might as well forget it because none of this will work for you. Hey, did you guys forget my chair or do I not get it this weekend? <laughs> I've gotten old enough to sit down when I want to, so. Praise the Lord. Actually, the middle of last year, I had a real serious back problem that lasted about four months, and I had to start sitting down a little. I got kind of used to it and kind of like it now. I thought, well, that's pretty good. I don't get nearly as tired when I sit some. Learning how to spend time with God is where everything comes together in our life. I like to look at it like everything else is pieces of a puzzle. You read my book on Battlefield of the Mind, you're going to get a few pieces of the puzzle. Oh, it's my, it's my stinking thinking. That's a problem. And we get so amazed by the truth. Oh. And then you go to church and you hear a great sermon. It's like, oh. and you're going to hear stuff this week. Oh. And then you're going to wonder why it's not working in your life. Because you bought the shirt. You went to the seminar, you even bought the CDs, and the DVDs, and still you just think, what is my problem? I go to church, <laughs> well, you know what I've found out, and I'm so thankful for it. All of those are pieces of the puzzle, but we have to go to God, and in His presence, Say, God, I need you to make this work in my life. Well, godly discipline is the only thing that will produce what you say you want in life. A lot of people say they want things, but then they don't want to do what they need to do to get them. And I'm encouraging you to put both of those pieces together and you'll have a great result.
But I know that I know that I know that the Word of God is true and that He changes lives and He gives you a life worth living. Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld concrete humanitaire hulp biedt? Door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen, het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer. Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and, you know, taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. You know, it's really great to have the ability to feed children all around the world. And I have a goal and a desire to keep feeding more and more all the time. This after-school feeding program serves an average of 90 to 100,000 hot meals per One year. One meal for these kids is, is survival. Well, I'm here in Thailand at one of our children's homes. You can feed, house, and educate a child. Hope Cambodia has been absolutely amazing. We've opened 15 different orphanages. And we're so grateful to be able to build this well here in Sri Lanka. We love to get clean drinking water to people. Well, so the water they're drinking is not making their children sick, and it's, it's not dirty, contaminated water. <laughs> definitely feel in Haiti just the absolute desperation. I'm at the Cure Hospital in Malawi, Africa. A huge line of people who are waiting to see our nurses and our doctors. Many doctors and medical people have volunteered their time. We are in Summers Point, New Jersey. Well, today we're, we're in Joplin, Missouri. We're here in Haiti in the village, and we're about to move people into brand new houses we've built. The winds were so constant with these big, big gusts. It was terrifying. 150 or more were killed. Thousands left homeless. Hey, you there, guys? Uh, those gifts from Joyce Five Ministries. Here in Zimbabwe, I was able to hand out the two millionth bag in a prison. That you can't have a Today. Don't know how many, you know, lives you guys save by coming in and showing the love that you guys show. Human trafficking, today's term for modern slavery. We've been working in different parts of the world and providing a, a place for women to come out of that lifestyle and be restored. It, it, there's no limit here. This is this is ran by God. He changes lives in Project Hope. You can change. You can get healing. You can survive. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan de mens te boven. En misschien vraag je jezelf af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand. begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joyce-meijer.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed. Het is het waard. You know, I don't think that we can underestimate the power of habits in our lives. First, we farm habits, and eventually they farm us. In my new book, Making Good Habits, Breaking Bad Habits, you'll discover that the freedom from bad habits lies in filling your life with one good habit after another. And with God's help, I believe you can put an end to struggling with bad habits and discover a new level of success in your life. Get my new book today. In this book vertelt Joyce how het aanleren van goede gewoonten je leven kan verbeteren. Nu ook verkrijgbaar op DVD. En profiteer van de setkorting via onze website joyce-meijer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100.